There's a book that I had to use in acting school in one of my classes. It was called Truth in Comedy. And I always liked that phrase, truth in comedy. And the basic idea of the book is it would teach you different uh, acting games that you would do to learn different uh, skills here and there. But that phrase has always been something that I've, I've gravitated to because I think there is a lot of – there's helpfulness in that phrase, truth and comedy. Because sometimes in order to really make a point or to understand a situation, we kind of have to make light of it first. Otherwise, it gets a little too serious and, and we don't want to deal with it. And so we, we see this in different shows or movies. In fact, one of my favorite playwrights is Neil Simon. You probably know Neil Simon from like The Odd Couple and things like that. Neil Simon actually just died a few weeks ago, actually. Um, but he has a way of, of writing uh, great situations that if it wasn't for the comedy, you would go, wow, this is – we don't want to deal with this. I mean think of something like The Odd Couple. Right, you, and the Odd Couple is one of his just like slapsticky comedies where it's just joke after joke after joke and they're moving around. But the situation is, itself is it's kind of a sad one. It's these guys who are not with their wives, and it's it's this situation. It's one guy he can't handle it, and he's all by himself, and he's trying to figure out how he's going to work through the situation. So if you subtract the comedy out of it, it's more like a melodrama, and it would kind of maybe seem like a a, a, a soap opera, right? It could be like that where it's like no. But, but he has a way of adding in the, the flavor of the humor that helps us to look at a situation like that from a different perspective. So we see that in all kinds of different situations. We want to talk about something that maybe is a little bit really serious, but, but we want to deal with it. So we have to bring in a little humor to make it workable for us, palatable, I guess you could say. A few examples that I, I came up with that I was thinking of is first this, Hogan's Heroes. Remember this one? Now, my question always was, who was the man in charge of making this pitch to the company? Because if you really think about it, so he's like, hey, guys, I have an idea for a new sitcom, a new television show we want to put on. We need your money to produce it. We want to get it. Let me give you the backstory. First, time period, World War II. Setting, a Nazi prison camp, but it's a comedy. And you go, what? Right? You wouldn't think that that time period and that setting would really lend itself to some slapstick humor, but hey, I guess they made it work, right? What about this? Any fans of this show? MASH, right? Similar, right? Dealing with a, a time of war and you have these group of people and they're, they're in that medic camp and they're trying to help people. And when you normally think of MASH, you think of it as a comedy. Right? It was one of the most successful sitcom comedies on television. It ran for 11 seasons from 1972 to 1983. Do you guys remember that time period? I don't remember it. <laughs> Generally, we think of it as a comedy. However, there was moments throughout it that weren't so funny. Right? And maybe you can think of a few of those if you remember the show. The very last uh, sh the very last, uh, the season finale of the, of the entire series, there's a, a scene in it that I, I've seen a few times. In fact, it, it always makes the list of different like top ten sad moments in sitcoms. And maybe you remember the chicken story. Do you remember the chicken story in MASH? Well, there was a moment in that show where Hawkeye, you know, Alan Alda, and Hawk Alan Alda, you know, he's always talking like this, and he's very quick, and he's very, you know, you don't think of him being a very dramatic guy in that show. But he tells the story of when they were on a bus one time with all these people and the enemies out there and they have to be quiet and they have to be quiet and they're trying to be quiet because they don't want the bad guys to hear them in there. And so he's, shh, everybody be quiet. But there's a lady in the back holding a chicken and the chicken won't stop gobbling and they're like, shut that chicken up. But it wasn't really a chicken. In his mind, he made it to be a chicken because what the lady does is she kills the chicken so it'll stop making noise. And in this scene, he's talking to a psychiatrist because he's having all kinds of issues because he was the one that said, shut that thing up, but it wasn't a chicken, it was a baby. Now, when you watch that scene, it's, it's difficult to watch him talking about it because then Alan Alda bursts in tears and he says, it was a baby. That's a comedy, right? Sometimes there's truth in comedy where we're looking at a, a comedic actor and they can say something in a way that really impresses us because we're not used to them talking that way. 
One thing that we like to do in our house is we, we try to get the girls to, to look at some old musicals and stuff. And one musical that we like is Annie. And this is, this is the, the main one that we're going to talk about today because it goes with what we're dealing with in our text. And, and I produced this show a number of years ago. Kate was like two years old when I, when I did the show at my school. And so we listened to the music a lot because I was doing it. She ended up liking it. So we ended up watching this movie all the time. It was playing. And uh, the very opening song, you think about a musical, it's all about like jumping and singing and hey, everything's great and wonderful. But then you think about the setting, it takes place in an orphanage, right? In a bad orphanage where they're not treated well. And these kids are having a very difficult time. You could say they're having a hard knock life, <laughs> right? Anybody? Help me out here. <laughs> But it's the first song that really grabs my attention when I think about the seriousness in comedy or something that is loosely supposed to be serious. The first song is called Maybe. And it's where they're singing, maybe far away, maybe r real nearby. And they're singing about their parents, these, these girls in this orphanage. And they say, you know, I bet you, I bet you they read and sew. Maybe they made me a full closet of clothes. I bet you they're so wonderful and so nice. And then the song goes, their only mistake was, was giving up me. And in the movie version of it, she's singing this song with these lyrics that are pretty deep when you really think about them. And there's this one little girl who, you know her in the film because she always says, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Well, when she's singing that song, she says to herself, oh, my goodness, because that's what they desire. They, they want a family, right? They want to belong. They, they don't even care that, they're, that they've been given up and they've been dropped off at an orphanage. Their whole idea is, I, I still want those people, because maybe they made this mistake, but in my head, they're still so wonderful and so great. Why, why don't they want me? And the truth here, it, even in done in a musical sense where it seems flashy to us, is that's a desire that is in all of our hearts. Is that we need to be needed. We want to be wanted by people. That, that, that at times in our life we may feel like we are separated or isolated by ourselves. And we need to feel that we belong. We need to feel that, that somebody cares about us, that if we weren't here, that it would, it would make somebody sad. In fact, we, 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 we see movies and we watch shows like that, for whatever kind it is, and at the end of it, whenever you, they all live happily ever after, because they do an Annie, right? They all find a home at the end. She finds a billionaire. That works out really well for her. When after happily ever after and the credits start rolling, we say, that sounds great, but it's just a movie. Right? That, that I recognize my longing in that as well, to have belonging, to be part of something. But at the end of it, we have to shake it off and go, but I realize that's, that's imagination, it's pretend. It can't really happen to me. I can't really ever find that type of longing. I can't ever really find that type of belonging that my heart so desires, right? We might even do it as we read the Bible at times, right? You read something like the book of Ruth, and, and you have this girl Ruth in the beginning with Naomi. It seems like, wow, things are going bad because their husbands die and they're all alone. But as the story progresses, what happens to Ruth? She finds Prince Charming. Right? It seems to work out. Not only does that relationship work out with finding with Boaz and, and with her mother-in-law, and she worships the one true God, now it turns out that her story is bigger than she could ever possibly imagine. Leading on to King David himself. Eventually leading on to Jesus Christ. Where her name then is in Matthew chapter 1 and the genealogies leading up to Christ. That's an amazing thing. But maybe we read our Bible and we go, we close it and we go, that's not for me though, right? That sounds too good to be true. I'll never get that type of feeling of belonging. I'll never be part of something like that. That's how we watch movies. That's how we read things from time to time. However, if you remember, when we're talking about this letter to Ephesians... The first thing I wanted to get across is this. 
God's story is our story when we are in Christ. But that's one of the things that we're trying to put in our mind, that, that we might look at this grand scheme of the Bible and go, that's an amazing thing that God has done. But we might seem ourselves to be separated from it, that we're just spectators watching what God is doing, and then we're waiting for the credits to roll because we say, I could never really be part of that, could I? I'm just a spectator. When the reality is the book of Ephesians is pointing us to this truth. You are not a spectator. This is your story. You are part of this grand story that God is doing in history. Because when we are in Christ, this story is ours. And particularly this passage that we're looking at today, focusing on verses 5 and 6, gives us this idea of adoption. And that's what that video was that didn't work. It was this basic idea of, of what does adoption mean to a child. Now, I've, I've worked with a number of, of students in the past that have either they've been in some kind of a foster care system or they were adopted themselves. Uh, that's something that Laura and I have talked a lot about. And once our girls are older, we want to adopt and we want to foster. We want to do that as much as we possibly can, both kind of having that teacher thing. I think we're kind of wired for it. But... Talking to some of the older students who have been in and out of some of these foster care systems, you know, once you start, once you hit junior high, high school, you know you're not getting a home. That's pretty much what it is. Because everybody wants the babies, they want the little ones. Once you're a junior high, high school, you know, maybe once in a while you'll visit somewhere, but mostly, you know, you're just going to phase out. You're going to turn 18, 19, 20, and then they're going to phase out of the system. And it's that, that breaks my heart to hear them say that. Because I've had some conversations with students like that. You know, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm stuck here. Nobody wants me. You know, I've tried. I've gone to some houses and it didn't work out and I was sent back. Can you imagine that? Being a child, staying in a home, and then a few months later they send you back? What do you say to that kid? And what does that do to that kid's mind and the way that they look at themselves the rest of their life? When we look at this idea of adoption and we see what how God has adopted us when we're in Christ, I think it is, I mean, when we talk about coming to Christ, we normally talk about justification, right? Our sins are forgiven. Christ died. His blood washes us clean so we can stand before the Father. We can be with God for all eternity. And justification is amazing gift that God has given to us. But in a sense, justification is more the legal side of it. right? Even that word, it's the courtroom setting of standing before God as God being the judge. But it doesn't just end there. And if we end there, we could possibly have this idea of a, of a cold, unfeeling God. When the reality is God doesn't end it there. He doesn't end the story there. Our justification being made right before God happens And then it moves to our adoption, where God takes us, he makes us clean, and he makes us his. And we become part of his family. Then we we are are co-heirs with Christ. We are in Christ. We are with God for all eternity. So it's not just like etch-a-sketch, we got rid of it, you're good. But it's now you come live with me. Now I'm going to love you the rest of your life. Now I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to be there no matter what happens. This is what we have in Christ. So last week we spoke of the eternal calling of God. That he chose people before the foundation of the world. We just read that in verse 4. But God is not without purpose in his actions and in his decisions. Meaning he doesn't just call his people before the foundations without purpose or without a particular reason. And ultimately, his particular reason is that we may be one eternal family, one eternal community of loving connection together. And the church is a glimpse of what the full reality that is. Being a part of the church gives us a glimpse of what that's like. 
where we are people for all sorts of backgrounds and, 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 and different uh, places around this world and different histories, different likes and dislikes, and we come together under the common banner of Jesus Christ. That's a glimpse of eternity. And it's an amazing gift that we've been given. So this morning as we look at this, we're going to look at four basic reasons or, or, or ways in which God has called us into this adoption. First thing we're going to look at is here in verse, uh, what is it? Five. Now you might notice, depending on your translation, that the words in love come before verse five. And it kind of seems weird to uh, put up a new verse starting there. Or your translation might say, blameless before him in love, period. And guess what? They're both right. Because there's no punctuation in, in, this, in the original Greek. In fact, as far as we can tell, the first uh, 14 verses is one long run-on sentence in, in when Paul wrote this. So if Laura was editing this paper, she wouldn't have, uh, Paul would have had some you know, argument between her. But um, because you know, we're doing English around here, we try to add the punctuation and all that kind of stuff. But this in love, connecting into verse 5, works either way, and the meaning stays the same. So verse 5, he says, In love he predestined us for adoption. In love. And I want to hold on to that phrase for a second. Because, you know, last week we were talking about how sometimes this is a difficult topic because we have so many misunderstandings and divisions that have come across from this first chapter here, this first section, because of words like choice and predestined, and it's caused all sorts of issues in the church. And our goal is to say, what does the text say? I don't want my traditions to come get in the way. I don't want what, I, you know, what I've always been taught to get in the way. I want God's word to tell me what it says. I want to understand it, and I want to submit myself to it. Right? Sola Scriptura, the word alone, that's what we're going off of. But the sovereign choice of God has nothing to do with what we have done. I think that's a great place for us to start. We're talking about in love. Meaning it's not because God saw something in you that he is working. It is not because God knew you would be great for the kingdom. It is not because you were so wonderful. Or even when we're talking about God thinking about time and God knows the future because he ordains the future and he sees all things equally vividly. It's not because God looked down the corridors of time and saw what you were going to do and it was going to be good choices. It has to do only with his love, with his will, with his desire to demonstrate his glory in you. That's why we say it's grace. Because grace alone means there's nothing we did to earn it. This is the true unconditional love of God. The unconditional love of God that shows us, God, it's not that I did anything. In fact, it's in spite of who I am. It's in spite of what is in my heart. It is in spite of the choices I would make. Again, think about this. Think about the orphans in the orphanage. Imagine going there and you line them all up against the wall. And you say, okay, I'm going to pick a few of you, but let's see who can do the best tricks first. Right? Let's, let me give you all a test. You take the test first and we'll see who, who aces their test. And then I'll pick it. That's not the way that God makes his choice of his people. He does it because he so desires to do so. God, in love, predestined us for adoption. In fact, when the Apostle John thinks about the fact that we become the children of God, he, he can't think of anything higher that demonstrates God's love. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. You know how you, you say to kids, how much do you love me? And you do this much, this much, and we do this much behind my back. It means it goes all the way around. Right? And we do the thing in the house, how much do you love me? And the girls will weigh themselves. I'll give you 50 pounds, or however much they weigh. That's all of me. 
And it's like the Apostle John is saying, how much does God love us? Well, what can I think that will amplify God's love? How can I make it clear to us? Does God love us you know, this much or this much? How can I make it clear to us? And this is what he comes up with. John chapter 3, verse 1, or 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. See, he says, how can I explain the kind of love, how much love God has for you? He could say that God has made you his, his servant. And that alone would be, yes, I'm the servant of God. But he goes further than that. He says, see how much love that God has given to you. He, he, he's made you his cousin. Woo! Because even that would be pretty cool, right? There's still a connection there, right? If you have a cousin and they are like, they're like a big name, you go, yeah, that's my cousin. But he says, no, no, see what kind of love that God has given to us. We're his children. He has called us his children. Now, if we have the mindset that we normally do in this world, that every single person is a child of God, that's not going to seem very special to us. That's a distinction we have to make. We are all God's creatures. We're all made in the image of God. We all have value and dignity and worth because we are made, we're image bearers of God. Yes, therefore all people matter to God. We should love all people. However, to be a child of God is a special blessing. It is a special blessing. First John chapter 1, no, no. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12 or 14. I think it's 12. He says, well, actually, let's, let me turn there so I don't say it wrong. John, chapter 1. Twelve, yes. This gives us the answer. Well, then how does somebody become a child of God? John, chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him... Who believed in his name, he gave the right to become a to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now I love Elvis Presley. And he says in that Christmas song, you know that we're all God's children and that makes everything right. Right? Remember that one? Here comes the place. But he's wrong. Sorry, Elvis. We're not all God's children. Being a child of God is a special blessing of God that is granted to us by through repentance and faith, by being born again. He says it right there. Not of the will of man, not of blood, but of God. How much love does God have for us that we who were once God-haters, who wanted nothing to do with God, wanted to only love our sin and to worship ourself, would be brought into a relationship with the creator of the universe, will be brought so close close to his bosom in the way that, that, that with our own children you hold them as a baby that kind of connection that kind of love is amplified infinitely when we're talking about the love of God for his children for his people I just I don't think we can ever exhaust that and I don't know if our minds will ever grasp that and I always wish I could explain it in a different way because I don't have the right words in love, he predestined us for adoption. In love, he predestined us for adoption. We are chosen to be adopted. That means that at one time we belonged to this world. We did not belong to God. That at one time we were apart from God. But through this adoption, as we come to Christ and God makes us his own, it changes things. It changes first our relationship with God. That, that when we are adopted into the family of God, now we have a special intimacy that we once did not have. Think about when you go to, to a, a new friend's house, or I remember being a kid and visiting a friend's house for the first time, and, and maybe you're there for dinner and you just feel so awkward because I don't know how they do dinner. right? I don't know what, what the norm is here. Where do I sit? Do I have to do something? What's going on here? And you try to walk around. You don't know where things are. There's a weirdness that takes time to kind of get used to. And at one time, we had that awkwardness in our relationship with God. 
We, were, we didn't know the things of God. Now, it seems like everybody in this world will say, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, if I say I believe in God, I know something about him. But they don't really know God himself. That awkwardness is now gone. So that in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, Now with the Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. That that intimacy allows us to have that relationship where we call God our Father. Now think about when Jesus was saying that in the Gospels, calling God his Father. What did they think about that? They didn't like it, did they? They said, why are you calling God your Father, making yourself equal with God? Now, we don't think that that makes us equal with God, but we recognize that that special intimacy that Christ has with the Father is the kind of intimacy that we now have in Christ. That special intimacy and connection that Christ has, we now have, where our spirit now cries out, Abba. And we normally talk about that word, and we say, oh, it means like daddy. When, when really, it's hard to actually find a, a Greek derivative of that. That phrase really is not a complete word. Really, it's closer to a sound. It's like it's not like a kid going daddy at like four or three years old or something like that. It's like a child that doesn't know how to speak yet saying dada. That's really more what it's like. When I don't, the, the baby doesn't really know any words and it's that natural thing to ca- cry out ma, da, something like that where it's just the sound to get the attention. So the word Abba is the cry of our heart. It's the sound. It's the noise where you say, ah! And God knows exactly what that means. Right? When you have a baby and they go, ah! What does that mean? Can you explain it to me? You know it means something. Well, when we cry out to God in that way, he knows exactly what we need. He knows what's in our heart. I think that's why Paul says sometimes... Just the groanings are enough. God, I don't know the words to say. I'm just going to groan. You know what it means. You know what I need. Because that special relationship and that connection is there. In fact, turn to uh, the Gospel of John chapter 17. It's page 903 in the Black Pew Bibles. John chapter 17, this is a section we call the high priestly prayer. One of my favorite portions of this is begins at verse 20, where he stops praying for his apostles and his disciples immediately right there, and he starts to pray for us. I love that Jesus prays for us. Look what he says in verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. Jesus was thinking ahead in the future. He said, I'm going to pray for these people. Verse 21, what's his prayer for us? That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, that the glory you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So not only does our adoption change our relationship with God, But it changes our relationship with God's people. It changes our relationship with those other people whom God has adopted. So, and as I said, that that us as the church, that's just a sneak peek of what that looks like in eternity. That we are called to be a unit. We are called to be a community that reflects the unity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's pretty amazing if we think about that. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, loving, glorifying, and, and being together for all eternity. And then we're to, we're to reflect that in who we are. 
Now that puts some high purpose behind the church. That's why it really it's important for us to be together as the church. When we're here to worship, this is no little light thing that we do. We're here to worship God, but we're also to reflect the, the character and nature of God to this world. Look what he says there. He says, why, why should we be perfectly one? At the end of verse 23, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. By being together in unity and harmony, we're reflecting what God has done in us to this world. That's a high calling for us. And we need to consider the seriousness behind that. To be adopted into the family of God means being with God's people in love and reflecting his glory wherever we find ourselves. In love, he predestined us for adoption, and he did so in Christ. And this is a phrase we're going to look at quite a bit later on because we're going to see this phrase or these two words over and over again, in Christ. Theologians have used this term, a union with Christ. And it is such an important little phrase that we underline in our Bible or make note of it every time we see it. Because it's a recognition that we don't do anything in our own strength or power. But we do everything as we are in Christ. That he is the one who is doing it. Right? That, that we, are to, we are called to work for God. We are called to, to serve him. But we recognize it is not I who works, but Christ who works in me. That our only hope to be in the family of God or to, to serve God as he has called us is because of what Christ has done for us upon the cross. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Just a brief way to look at this. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. And in this section, he's going to talk about how in Adam, because we are all born in Adam, we are all sinful. We, sin comes through Adam, but life comes through Christ. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So we are all born in sin because we are in the likeness of Adam. Right? We, we're, we're doing what we've seen. We're doing what is in our nature as sin has come into this world. But Adam, he says here, is a type, meaning the reality or the anti-type, technically speaking, is Christ who doesn't bring sin, who but brings about the righteousness that God requires. Verse 15, But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. Another great verse of this is, is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of Christ. We get the righteousness of Christ, he gets our sin. We get his goodness, he took our penalty. That's the great exchange of the gospel. When he's on the cross, that should have been us. He takes the punishment, we get the glory. That's an amazing gift. And it's through that justification, through being in Christ, that God brings us into his family through this adoption. However, he does not bring us into this family again just for the sake of doing it. Last verse we're going to look at this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter 2, this is on page 1015. We are chosen in Christ to worship him and to proclaim his excellencies. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 
But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. All right, we are a people for his own possession. We have been adopted into the family of God. So what are we called to do? Proclaim him. Tell the story of what happened to us. Say, this is who I am. I, I was born in sin. But God has changed me through Christ. Now, instead of being in this dark world, I, I, I want to walk in his marvelous light and tell the world about him. Verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are God's people. We all have this desire to be a part of something. We all need to belong. We all need to find worth together as a people. But ultimately that is found being in the family of God. Our ultimate desires of, of, of watching the movies and wanting to belong or be a part of something bigger than ourselves will never be realized in the things of this world, but only in what God has given to us. How much love does God have for his people? So much that he calls them the children of God. That he doesn't leave us to our own devices in this world. He doesn't let us go off in this world raggedy trying to figure things out. He adopts us. He brings us into his family. He takes care of us. He provides for us. And when we are in Christ, he does that now, but he will do so for all eternity. As we read the book of Ephesians, we see this as a letter to us to show us our place in God's story. And if you are in Christ, your place is not as a servant, not as a cousin, not even as a best friend, but as a child of God. And that is an amazing blessing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is a joy to even say that you are.